With that said, I'm going to introduce uh, Don Howard, who's going to moderate the next panel on, uh, on designing for inclusive sizes, extended sizes. Um, Don spent uh, 30 years plus in apparel retailing and joined Alvinon initially, I think, as a consultant and then became an executive director in 2013 and heads up their consumer insight uh, business. Uh, so, Don, please. Appreciate it. Hello. Okay, thanks. Uh, I need my panelists. Why don't you come on up? Actually, one I haven't met yet. That should be interesting. Come on up. Can you hear me? Okay, all the way in the back? Great. Ah, there's the one I haven't met yet. Come on in. Have a seat. Uh, I'll put that down. Hi, I'm Jessica. Yeah, they're meeting, <laughs> meeting each other for the first time as well. All right, so designing for inclusive sizing, our panel discussion. Um, I'm delighted to have these three ladies with us. Um, still missing one. Come on, it's your time. Uh, Don Howard, lead the global consulting group at Alvanon, helping brands and retailers all over the world shaping the future they're fit. It's a pleasure of mine to be able to do that and an honor, and I'm pleased to have these three ladies with us today. Um, since I haven't met Becca, I'll start with you. How are you? I'm great, thanks. Uh, Becca McCarran is the founder and creative director of Future Forward Bodywear brand, Chromat, right? A Forbes 30 under 30 pick for people who are reinventing the world. McCarran Tran is focused on bridging the worlds of technology and fashion through empowering swimwear for all bodies. Welcome, thank you for being here. Paulina Vexler co-founder and CEO of Universal Standard, a brand she started with her business partner to help disrupt the apparel industry by taking size out of the equation and laying the groundwork for the future of fashion to include women of all sizes. Paulina, thanks for being here. Thank you for having me. Jessica Kahan Devorit, did I do that right? Pretty good. Close enough, okay. <laughs> She's the VP of Brand Merchandising at Gwinnie B which is an innovative and size-inclusive subscription apparel rental service. In her role, she's responsible for developing, buying, and assorting all of the clothing that's offered on that service, uh, and as well as positioning the overall brand. So ladies, thank you so much for being here. So let's get started. Um, I'd like if you could each um, just kind of give us an overview of the brand vision. Um, and the business model itself. Becca, I'm going to pick on you because I haven't met you yet. Hi. <laughs> Let's start with you. Sure. So I started Chromat um, in 2010. It's been eight years. I came from architecture. I never studied fashion. Um, been making it up as I go along. But um, yeah, as far as size inclusivity, we've been showing at New York Fashion Week and our runways have always featured all different sizes of models, ethnicities, ability levels, places on the gender spectrum. It's been always a really important um, focal point for me to use the platform that we have as fashion designers to showcase a wide range of beauty and to kind of open up the industry in our, on our catwalks. And then it only happened recently that I, we finally got our first plus size order. So we've been showing plus size models um, on the runway, but it wasn't until this spring that Nordstrom was the first re retailer to place a big order for our size um, XL through 3X. So we're just now, we've been in Barney's for many years and in many different sh shops, but only up to size large. So being in the plus size space in a retail presence is something new for us and it's really exciting to finally be here. Great, thank you very much. Uh, let's see, Paulina, can we go to you next? Um, we started Universal Standard uh, almost three years ago now, and we started to enable women of all sizes to shop together. We thought there's no reason why a size 6 or a size 32 couldn't walk up to the same rack and buy a piece of clothing. And it has been a three-year journey, and we started from a size 10 going up to a size 28. And we recently expanded our size range to go from a size 6 to a size 32. Thank you. 
Jessica, you have a bit of a different business model. Could you explain that for us? Sure. So we're buyers of size inclusive fashion. Uh, Gwinnibi is also a relative newcomer to the scene. We were founded about six years ago uh, with a vision of giving women a new way to experience fashion. Um, and it was the original vision was all women, but we started with the largest part of the market. So. Um, Surprisingly, given where so much of the industry's efforts go, only 20% of women are smaller than a size 10. So we started by serving women sizes 10 to 32, and that had a uh, similar reckoning that uh, our vision was about serving all women. Um, and uh, to be inclusive, you can't really uh, exclude anyone. So earlier this year, we went size inclusive, uh, which now means we serve women's, women zero to 32 um, through our uh, subscription rental offering. Terrific, thank you. Well, there's one thing in my work that puzzles me. Um, of course, today there's no shortage of statistics and data to quantify the uh, market potential and the business opportunity that exists. And now I'm not talking about, I'm talking about the inclusive size range. Um, but in reality, these trends have existed for decades. I know personally, I've been working with plus size and extended sizing for over 30 years. But for the last three years or so, five years, our customers come to us. They want to know what's going on in plus size. How can we get this? How can we capture this market? And it always, I, I'm kind of thinking, you know, what has really changed? Jessica, in your view, what's going on? Why, why suddenly all the excitement and, and buzz around plus sizing? Sure. I mean, we've done a good bit of research. Um, most by that, I mean talking to our customers over the last five years. Um, and we've really seen a generational shift um, among older uh, women, or um, not particularly old, but older than millennial women, there was really an acceptance that plus was a different market. There were plus retailers and straight size retailers. There were plus size departments and straight size departments. Um, and they, they accepted that the world divided. The millennial customer does not view the world that way. She sees a world of fashion, um, and she wants the same styles uh, that are offered to her friends who uh, happen to fall um, in a size that is considered part of the straight size range. Um, so we're really seeing a real demand from consumers to approach the market um, uh, inclusively and holistically, um, as, as with all things, I think the, you know, uh, social media, um, the world is just becoming a lot more open. Um, and so not only are millennials seeing everything, they are able to advocate uh, for it and we're really hearing them. Yeah, I agree with you. I definitely think it's because of the internet, Instagram, social media. We are no longer relying on gatekeepers of the industry like the Vogue to kind of decide what's in and out of fashion and what you see or kind of anoint um, curators of the fashion space. Now anyone can be a curator of this fashion space no matter what size they are. Everyone has a platform to speak out and tell retailers, tell designers that they need to be showing or reflecting back themselves in, in their ads. So I think the social media has really changed the game. Paulina? Yeah, completely agree. The body positivity movement has played a huge role in acceptance and loud voices on social media made people realize that there's no reason why 100 million women in the US should be ignored. Yeah, I have uh, 20 something daughters and I know that they've grown up in a world where um, inclusivity is an expectation. You know, diversity is an expectation. Why would I see anybody else any differently than I've seen myself? And I, I think that really has a big impact on this entire acceptance and, and quite frankly, a demand that everyone is, is, is kind of represented equally. My two cents worth. Uh, okay, so let's, let's talk about this. Um, I'll start with Becca and Polina. You know, so what, in all this world of going on around us now, what prompted you to start your brand? For us, this whole thing started as a story of friendship. Uh, my business partner and I both um, spend a lot of years abroad, found ourselves both in New York, and were introduced to each other. And we basically had no network, no friends, and gravitated to each other and one day we were invited to go to an event and I was super excited to go uh, to meet more people, broaden my network and all of a sudden she said, I'm not going. And I said, why aren't you going? And she said, I have nothing to wear. 
And I said what I thought was absolutely the most obvious thing. I was like, you live a couple blocks from Fifth Avenue. Let's just walk over and buy you something. We're definitely going to this event. And she looked at me like I had two heads. And she said, there's not a single store on Fifth Avenue that I could walk into and buy clothing for myself. And for a lot of people who are not suffering from the lack, this whole world is behind a veil. And so that's when she kind of brought me into her world. We went to a department store, and as has been said earlier, uh, walked past all the beautifully merchandised, nicely perfumed floors up to the furniture floor, and next to the nonstick pot and pans and the throw pillows and last year's bathing suits was the small little section. And she said, this is where I can shop. And I said, that can't be true because there's so many people. And I started doing the research and at 67%, as I said, 100 million women have been experiencing this. So we said we need to change it and not just change it from a... Um, let's make plus size clothing, because that's not what we're here to do. The world, I don't think the world needs another plus size brand. What we wanted to do is make shopping inclusive and get it to the point where no one has to just go up to the furniture floor. And if you're going, you're going with all your friends because you don't need to sit um, outside of the dressing room and be the one to bring the clothing to your friends. You want to have that social experience that has been lacking. And that's what we set out to do from the beginning. And um, that's the story. That's awesome. Thank you very much. Becca, how about you? We started, well, Chromat began as a side project I was doing after work. I was working in a small town in Virginia as an architect. And um, I was just experimenting. It was started from a very strange experimental place. We made like scaffolding for the body. I was applying my architecture to the body as building site. And um, yeah, I started having little fashion shows in Virginia and a coworker heard about it. He introduced me to someone in New York who was opening up a little holiday pop-up shop and we put a few pieces in the pop-up shop and then it kind of snowballed from there. I moved to New York thinking I would keep working as an architect, but I kept getting orders for the things and just filling the orders myself. I would sew everything myself and ship it out. And then, um, so we were doing these kind of architectural corsetry scaffolding type pieces for many years and we s sort of stumbled into swim and lingerie and swim really took off as our commercial success. And um, so we've been doing a lot of swim. We go to Miami Swim Week, that's like our big market. But as far as like how we entered the plus size space, even my little runway shows I was doing in Lynchburg, Virginia, I showcased a range of my friends. I've always been inspired by my friends who are artists, um, fellow creators, and I've always wanted them to be the models of our shows. And so from the beginning, we've always kind of reflected back our inspiration and celebrated Chromat Babes of all places um, and sizes. So, you know, someone asked me recently, like if we wanted to kind of be cornered into the plus size market or that be our um, kind of selling point to investors. And for me, my goal is that one day, just like you're talking about, that there's uh, inclusive sizing for everyone, that it's just inclusive across the board. And this is no longer a press story. I'm really, really excited for that day. So thank you. So let me follow up on that. I'm really curious. So when you approach, you know, from an inspiration point of view, when you approach the collection, you know, where do you start? Are you thinking about all the potential sizes and shapes? Are you thinking, you know, what, what does that creative process look like? So we actually just recently changed our creative process and opened it up. Um, I was on a panel with um, someone recently at the Universal Standard. It was part of the CFDA, and they asked me... You guys, me if, you didn't tell me that. I know. We're old friends. On the, uh, but... um. See, Someone asked me if we sketch in the Chromat Studio on straight size, like croquis or dress forms or just a 2D. And I said, yeah, we actually do. And then I was like, that needs to change now. So it just started recently that we, well, we have an alpha form size 22, which is amazing. And it's really changed the way we drape. 
but um, we took the, the 2D rendering of the size 22 alpha form and have been sketching on that as well. And just in the initial idea process, when you're ideating on lines, you see how drastically different it is when there's just more real estate. And you know, prints look different, everything looks different. So our process now, we're sketching for, for two different sizes and I think it's really opening up this new kind of like focus on interesting designs. Great. Paulina, do you want to add anything? Yeah, I think we've all kind of just been conditioned to think that the sample size is a size two, four, six. All we are trying to do is shift the spotlight. Where the spotlight has been on those sizes, we're just really just trying to shift to what the true middle is. And the true middle is not the two, four, six. The true middle is the 16, 18, 20. So we start our process by designing for the average woman. And the average woman is a size 18 or 16, and we go from there. So that's where we start. Okay, I'm sorry to leave you out of this. So I'll get to you in a minute. Enjoy. I want to follow up on what you just said. So how do, what constitutes an inclusive range? How do you decide that? For us, our goal is to go from a size zero to a size 40. That's an inclusive range. Yeah. And how about you? I think inclusion is not just size, but it's race, it's ability, it's you know, places on the gender spectrum. So one piece of, or one piece of the puzzle that we're really cracking right now is um, making sure that our team, our design team is diverse racially, um, you know, uh, not all cis people, people that are transgender, or, you know, people from different backgrounds. I think the more different ideas you have going into the design process, the better your designs can be. So hiring in a diverse way and making sure that the back end as well as the runway is inclusive is our focus. And that's wonderful. Uh, and and in, in, in my business and what we do, people really get hung up on size as well they need to be because they have the reality of being able to produce a certain range and have it in stock and in the store. A lot of our clients struggle with the size name itself, right? What do we call this inclusive size range? So, uh, you know, how did you tackle that and what was the thinking behind it? Paulina, go ahead. So we try to practice what we preach. We said if a size medium is an 1820, that's going to be the medium. And so that's the medium and we go down from there and up from there. So we have 2XL or 2XS or 3XS, but the medium is the 1820 and the small is a 1416 and the extra small is a 1012. And you just put a stick yeah. in the sand and that's what we're gonna do, And that's right? what we're gonna do, yeah. As we, um, like I said, we got this big Nordstrom order recently, and so we just started having retail presence in up to 3X, which for us is about a 24. It's so confusing. I was really, I like racked my brain. I looked at every retail website to see how their sizing was laid out. I put them all into a big Excel together, figured out like who's doing what. It's all over the place. It's, it's so confusing. And yep. you know, the way we started, we started, um, we skipped 1X, so we went up Excel, and then it was 2XL, 3XL, and then we scrapped that, and now we're doing XL, 1X, 2X, 3X, but I mean, <laughs> it's, it's a confusing it's a subject. Yeah, it's a very, yeah. There is no standardization. We, we think that in women's wear in general, there's a lack of standardization. Forget it when you get into the plus size range. There is no standardization. Well, what do you guys think about standardization? Do you think there should be, everyone kind of decides a size 30 inch waist is whatever size, or do you think that everyone having their own sizing makes each brand, like for example, everyone is different, everyone's bodies is different. If I know that I fit a large and chrome mat, then I can always, I don't know, I feel like each, especially with bra sizing, there's certain brands that are made for certain silhouettes or like full bust. I don't know, I, it's really confusing. Should we have standardization or should we have niche sizing based on the silhouette? Are you asking them? I'm, yeah, kind of. <laughs> or you guys? I don't know. It's so confusing. That's a really deep subject. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, mean, I don't know if the answer to should, but it is uh, something that we use um, technology and data for. There is such, uh, there's such a difference in the size range um, between um, sizes. So we actually, as a brand, uh, as a retailer, have developed what we call our canonical size. 
Uh, and so we effectively normalize every brand size chart to a single set of sizing so that, our, so that we can make recommendations uh, to help our members understand uh, the jungle of sizing out there. I knew you'd make your way in eventually. <laughs> now that we're on the subject, thank you ladies. Listen, um, describe a little bit how you curate the assortment that you offer. Obviously the subscription service, we've heard about Stitch Fix and Rent the One Way and you know this is another uh, a, a type of service like that. So how do you um, uh, do your merchandising assort and, and size range for the inclusive market? Sure. So uh, Gwinnie B uh, is what we call subscription apparel rental. So uh, the way to think about that is think about Netflix back in the day when they still sent DVDs. So you pay a fixed price a month. So for Gwinnie B, you would pay uh, $69 for a two plan, $95 for a three plan. Um, and that, the critical thing there is per month. So uh, if you're on a three plan, what that means is that we'll send you three pieces of clothing at a time. You can wear it once, twice, uh, as many times as you want, send it back, we'll send you something new. Uh, so a typical member on a three plan uh, who's actively using the service will get between nine and 12 pieces of clothing for that $95 subscription price. Uh, the primary difference from a Netflix is that, as we all know, clothing is very emotional. So if someone falls in love with a piece, she can buy it. Uh, so we are, um, you know, we talk about uh, separating the experience of fashion from the expense. So you can wear effectively, um, you know, nine pieces of clothing for the cost of one. Uh, so we are thinking about our assortment from the perspective of rental. Uh, rental is actually incredibly complementary to core businesses because at the end of the day, the consumer is very rational. Um, and what it makes sense to rent is actually quite different from what it makes sense to own. So if anyone's ever been shopping, seen a, you know, a, for me it happens with black boots, a pair of boots you love, they're of course more expensive that you wanna spend, and then you sit there and do the math in your head and you say, okay, well I'm gonna wear this four times a week and if I amortize it across those wares, that's actually less expensive than you know, these um, much less expensive pumps over here that I'm only gonna wear once or twice. Um, and so effectively, that's how our member rents. So we don't do as well with basics. So if you think about the traditional uh, fashion pyramid, um, it's almost turned on its head. So we assort for color, we assort for print, uh, we assort for those statement pieces um, that are actually very unprofitable for traditional retailers. Uh, they're what you produce to sell your core basics. Um, uh, and, and we look to buy those. Um, and you know, we found that uh, we can tell you that women of all sizes want to buy the clothing that makes them stand out. And what they love about wearing this clothing, what they tell us is they wear them and they get compliments. Um, and you know, um, you know, anyone or everyone loves to get complimented. So you know, you know, there are all these myths out there, or there historically were about what's appropriate for what sizes. And we buy print, we buy color, um, we buy the statement people pieces. We assort it uh, in sizes zero to thirty-two, um, and um, she loves it. I would say uh, that. The key challenge for us is we are looking for um, not only vendors that um, offer items in both uh, what is currently today called Missy and Plus, but also the same style. And frequently you'll see um, vendors that are uh, in both lines, their plus line or their women's line will be 30% the size of their Missy, and then only a small fraction of that is overlapping pieces. You know, I would love to advocate for more development of styles um, from extra small through 3X, we'll buy it up to 5X, um, because that's actually what the customer wants, and, and that's what we're looking to buy. Thank you very much. Listen. I want to get to some audience questions, but I do have a couple of practical questions I'd like to ask you. You know, anytime a brand works with us, or even in my past experience working with brands, when they consider a plus size, I'm sorry to say the word, uh, extended sizing, um, they're daunted by all the challenges that might be out there. So can you give me one challenge that was a particular struggle for you when you started out your uh, venture? For us, it was everything because we both did not come from a fashion background. We didn't know how to man 
manufactured clothing. We were in a factory in Peru, and they asked us what our grade rules were, and I had to Google grading. So that was... <laughs> There's that. That's where we started. So there is not, everything was a challenge. Okay, good answer. How about you? For me, my challenge was pricing. The um, price of a straight size chromat swimsuit is like between two or three hundred dollars, which is on the high end retail luxury price point for swim. And when we introduce it in plus, I think we're still finding that luxury high end plus customer because I think a lot of people, fans, and followers that are wear size 2X or whatever, they're used to shopping at Forever 21 Curve, or they're, they're not buying at that price point for a variety of reasons, which we could sit up here all day and talk about. That's for sure, yeah. How about you? Uh, well, the biggest challenge in our business is fit. Uh, we need to send clothing that is going to fit members. That's what's going to cause them to stay with the service. So that's why we use the data the way we talked about before, but really working with brands to help them understand um, that they need to fit on a um, second fit model, uh, that you can't grade just from a size six, and um, working with brands as partners to help them through that. Was there any challenge that you found that wasn't as hard as you thought it would be? Or was I it think, all hard? I think actually the fact that we did not know what we were doing was a huge plus because we just did it the way that made sense. So for grading, for example, everyone told us there are these grade rules, that you have to follow these grade rules. These grade rules made no sense to us. So we developed the system of micro-grading. And so we basically fit on every single size model. We see what every style looks on every single size model, and we micro-grade every single style. So fit is our number one priority, and we really try to focus to make sure to keep our return rates down and our repeat purchases up. And fit has been the number one thing that has allowed us to do that by not using a formula to grade. Awesome, look at you. Anything you'd like to add? Yeah, I, I actually want to echo, like, fit is obviously super important to us. When we launched um, our new extended sizing, we invited 100 people to come and try on all our sizes, and we got uh, over 500 fittings in four days, so we got lots of feedback. Um, it was a really amazing process, and we kind of realigned our whole uh, size scale from there. So that was um, a good thing. I would say the, the least challenge, or... We worked with a factory that has experience with plus size production, and so we just said we want them to 3X, and they did it. So you went with the expertise at that point. Yeah, it was really great partnership. How about you? Anything that surprised you that wasn't as hard as you think it would be in an inclusive size environment? Um, I think it's probably the point that I made earlier about the similarity in preferences, um, and you know um, that women of all sizes do want to wear these statement. Um, even though they're everyday clothing, kind of, you know, more statement pieces. Awesome, thanks. We would love to get any questions that we tried to cover as much ground as we could here, but we're going to run out of time. So does anybody have any questions they'd like to ask any of the panelists? Yes, please, stand up. Are any of you, are any of you working on any proprietary sizing technology? Okay, so the question is, are any of you working on any proprietary oh, sizing technology? I can tell by your face the answer is no. We're not, but maybe we should be. Yeah. <laughs> when I first entered Plus, I kind of wish that I had had some brands just tell me their size standards or their grading rules. You know, I, I don't know. There's no place where you can go and maybe you can download that all from Alvanon. <laughs> maybe. Uh, I mean, as I mentioned, where I was working on size recommendation technologies, um, our size advisor is what we call it. Um, to really help with that online experience and reduce return. All right, anybody else? Any questions? I got some hands. I got a hand in the back. Go ahead. So we are starting to experiment uh, because what we found is that it's not just apparel, it's everything from footwear to jewelry to um, soft accessories. 
which are not inclusive. And so my business partner told me she's never had a pair of boots that she could wear over her calf. And so we are starting to look into that. It is complicated to say the least. It is, it is same issues and a lot of different standards and um, starting from scratch, basically. Two more questions. Yes, please. My question is, um, can you talk about the difficulties with shape as you come into these larger sizes? Because from my understanding, it becomes like expo exponentially more difficult. Thanks. Who wants to take shape? Um, what we decided to do is we just picked a lane. So what a lot of um, brands, I think, try to do is they try to be everything for everyone and try to cover as much ground as possible. But the body topography is so different when you go into a, specifically the larger sizes. So we knew we would never be everything to everyone. So we picked the shape, we picked the lane, and we said we're going to master this one lane, and when we master it, we'll move on to something else. But we definitely did not want to have armholes big enough that are going to fit every single arm out there. We didn't want to have a waist big enough or cinched or not cinched that was going to be flattering to one or another. Stick with our lane and just design for that lane. That is an excellent answer, and by the way, it's a best practice, so good for you. Congratulations. Yes. Me? Oh, yes, please. Hi, um, obviously you have uh, people that are quite interested in buying your clothing uh, because it's, it fits and uh, it's really cool that you do that. But I was wondering if there's any people that have a kind of objection about what you call your clothing, like plus size and, and uh, that kind of stuff. And, what you say to them when uh, they have objections to that. And Ex if you're thinking of changing the uh, name. Thank you very much. And that kind of alludes to the question I asked earlier, because people struggle with that. What is the you know, psychology behind the name of the size and stigmatizing, if you will, something that's different than what we would perceive as you know, other? Anybody want to take that? I, yeah, people, um, I feel like talking about the stigma or talking about the term plus size, I think that's something that I get asked a lot. A lot of fashion um, editors are asking me, like, what do you call it? curve, plus size? What's, I feel that I'm open to all different labels. I think what has to go is the stigma around it. I think whatever way is useful for you to find what you need to buy, that's okay. I think just like... I think showing more models in Vogue that are 2X, it makes it seem more desirable. And I think you, it's a positive feeling of reflection that needs to be growing in the space. Yeah, I think the realities of it right now is no one's going to Google and searching size inclusive clothing. They're just not. They're putting in plus size clothing. However, if we're, we strongly believe that there's no future in plus size fashion. If we're all still sitting here five years from now talking about plus size fashion, we have failed. It's, fashion is all moving towards inclusivity, at least that's our goal, that's where we hope it's going. And so hopefully a day in the near future we'll just be talking about clothing and beautiful clothing and clothing for everyone and we won't need to type in plus size into google i love that thank you very much what a great way to end the panel Lee, could you thank you all ladies thank you so much for your time appreciate it